That was a very bad shot, Your Majesty. Yes, Grant. Yes, I suppose it was. Did I wound the poor thing? He may be wounded, sir. But he has the light of survival in his eyes. Come again. Perhaps. Perhaps. Shall we return? Thank you, Grant. Come in. Mr. Chamberlain and Sir Samuel Hall, Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, do sit down. We appreciate your seeing us, Stanley. I know you have a busy morning. Oh, yes, I do, rather. Uh, Winston's coming in with his preliminary budget proposals. Ah, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, Winston's the subject of our visit. Really? Yes, he, ha he has become something of a liability, Prime Minister. Mm. Well, now, uh, Winston is a senior member of my government, Sam, and... Uh, I can't see that the standing of the Chancellor of the Exchequer need be of great concern to the Secretary of State for air. I think Sam means the party don't like him. I've always felt I might be trusted to uh, gauge the mood of the party. Oh, indeed you can, Prime Minister, and uh, no one would deny that. But I am in close touch with backbench opinion. And whilst they like him as a star turn in the house, <laughs> there are rumblings, I do assure you. The main point is that Winston isn't trusted in the party because he's always out for office, never prepared for opposition. Opposition, Neville? Aren't we going to win the next election? We shall win, of course. But the Liberals could conceivably hold the balance of power. You do know that Winston's been having secret meetings with them, don't you? Yes. He met with Lloyd George about ten days ago. They discussed changes in the voting system as the price for liberal support and also certain cabinet changes. You're very well informed, Sam. What exactly do you propose I do about all this? Well, he could be moved from the Treasury. What, sacked by Chancellor, my right-hand man, just before a general election would be madness. And besides, I need his budget. Then you could do it afterwards. As soon as was decently possible. And where would I move him, do you suppose? Oh, anywhere. So long as it's not the Foreign Office. Can you imagine his indiscretions there? Oh, I don't know why not. After all, we have no really critical situations in foreign policy just now. He could be kept happy and busy planning wars in Afghanistan or elsewhere. Excuse me, Prime Minister. Mr. Churchill has arrived. Oh, good. Thank you, Geoffrey. One moment, please. If Winston were to leave the Exchequer for any reason, have you um, considered who should take his place? Of course, the job is generally regarded as a stepping stone to the Premiership. No, you're not thinking of resigning, are you? Oh, no, no, no. no. But in politics, it's always wise to lay your plans well in advance. Uh, isn't that so, Neville? I have no thought but the good of the party, Prime Minister. Oh, good, good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> but tell me this. Who would you personally most like to see as uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer? I haven't given the matter a great deal of thought, I'm afraid. Haven't you? Then I think uh, perhaps you should. Good day, gentlemen. Winston. Good morning, Sam. Winston? Good morning, Neville. Winston. Oh. My dear Winston, do come in. How good of you to give me some of your time today. When I'm sure all you really want is to return to your beloved charter. How did you enjoy Scotland? Scotland was cold, and the train journey was long. <laughs> and how is the king? Well, but he's aged. He no longer stalks. He goes out on the hill and has the deer moved about for him. 
Did he bag anything? From time to time, a noble stag, uh, moved by compassion, sprang from the heather and uh, <laughs> sacrificed itself. <laughs> to sit down. Do you have the budget proposals? We shall need something pretty special from you before the election. It's what my son Randolph would call a stunner. Winston, do you have anything for the working classes? Because this is the age of uh, mass politics, remember? Quite so. Well, Ramsay MacDonald and his socialists are going to have to learn. They've no God-given right to the working man's vote. No, I I've been working on improvements in education, health and welfare. Well, that ought to please Neville. So it should. The uh, Minister of Health seemed to me a poor advertisement for his department. Uh, when I saw him leave just now, nothing serious, I hope. No, 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 no. Well, he and Sam were uh, putting forward some of their own ideas, but um, no, I've told them the budget will be left in your capable hands. I shan't let them down. I'd like to give a real boost to employment this time, Stanley. Mm, without spelling it and counting the rings, thereby making nonsense of any argument you may advance for its preservation, Give a guess. Come along now, Prof. Ah, uh, mm, 200 years. 300. Must be that old at least. <laughs> 200. No more. Did you know, Winston, any scientific estimate must be made with extreme caution. The level with scientific caution. <laughs> I suppose I could always calculate its height against the rate of growth and arrive at... Uh, 300, just as I said. We should go up. Or would you like to see my brick wall? No, thank you, Winston. Not again. Do you know, Prof, I can now lay a brick a minute. Well, at that rate, I reckon to be finished by the spring. Here they come at last. Thank the Lord. I do hope they've settled it, Lamar. Otherwise, we'll have that blessed tree all night. Can I have one, Randolph? Yes, Mary. Whiskey, soda, water? <laughs> Brendan, what do you think? Lindemann's positive. It's 300 years old. Oh. I'd put it at no more than 250 myself. But even so, think what that means. <laughs> what the devil does it mean, Winston? Other than that it's damned old. Old and in the way. It absolutely ruins the view. Oh. All the same, Winston, I do wish you'd advise me. Do you think the poor old ironmonger will be upset if I stand for North Paddington in the spring? Without a doubt. The sun will go down upon his displeasure and rise upon his wrath. Ha! Ah, you think I should do it then, do you? What ironmonger? Hmm? The Prime Minister. The electro-plated squire of Budley, Stanley Baldwin, gent. You think I'll win, Winston? Not if you ignore public opinion. The power says it should be wooed like a reluctant virgin. Oh, tosh. Public opinion lost its virginity long ago. It's more like a load of butter-slapping grocers. My dear young friend, there was a time when it was proper for you to play the enfant terrible. But in five short years, you've become a man of substance. You own and direct a great financial newspaper. You have power and influence. And now you seek to enter the Senate of this country. Do not uh, disparage those whose votes you will shortly solicit. Pax, Winston. Pax. No, but you're quite right, of course. Only the other day, Goonie was chiding me about the very same... You meet my sister-in-law, Mr. Brett. Mm-hmm. Don't you find it sounds odd when family pet names are used by outsiders? Tell me. Winston, you spend no more than, what, on average, four hours a week building your wall? What? No, more like uh, eight, I should think. Well, say four. You can't work every second of eight hours. Well, it's a brick a minute when I'm at it, prof, a brick a minute. Precisely. It's a generous estimate, excluding uh, the odd week and the odd day. You may expect to finish your wall in, um, 11 years. <laughs> what? 1939? I'll never live that long. Meow. 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 
Claire, mate. Was my darling cat asleep? I was about to turn in myself when I suddenly realized that I hadn't said good night to you. Good night, my dear. Max telephoned an hour or so ago. Another night, Bird. I suppose I was feeling a bit down. I was unguarded enough to tell him, as I was afraid, we might not be able to hold off a combined onslaught of Liberal and Labour. He said... I don't he... think that we need to take anything that Lord Weaverbrook says very seriously. He's a good friend. A good friend who will use everything that you have said tonight. He will, Winston. Goonie said... But you know, you were, had no need to be so beastly to Brendan just because he called that She said that Max Beaglebrook is already denying, oh, so cunningly, that your ambition is now to shine in opposition. Do you know that he said you might even rejoin the Liberal Party? Fleming! Have you spoken to Randolph about that boy at Eton? What? No, no, I, I've forgotten all about it. He's upset, Winston. That boy in his house won't speak to him. He says you murdered his father in the Dardanelle campaign. Why do you want to hurt me? You and I both know that my plan for the Dardanelles would have succeeded. I know I was made the scapegoat for its failure, but then I was a minister of the crown and someone in war has to take the responsibility. But do you believe that I never remember, that I never think? of all those young lives wasted. I've learned to endure the public hostility that still lingers in... and must I have it thrown at me in my own home? What have I done to deserve it? Oh, Winston. Of course, Max is quite right. Mischievous and irresponsible, but he's quite right. I am disenchanted. I'm disenchanted with Baldwin. And with most of the others. Neville Chamberlain, the coroner, as Brenton calls him. Your Mr. Bracken certainly has the knack of inventing offensive nicknames for people. Yet I still think we have a chance of winning. I'm sure of it. A great walloping, tremendous victory. We must win. If we offer them peace abroad and stability at home, a clean, honest and impartial government, if we avoid the thimble riggers of three card trick men, avoid above all things, as we would the smallpox, any hints of that class warfare nonsense, the political hate, the socialist trafficking, if we persuade the average decent Englishman that we are not going to let anyone sell out the empire, let Egypt go, or abandon India to some crackpot self-government... Winston! What? Oh, my dear Vic. Well, you see, uh, that's the stuff I shall, I shall give them. We shall win, Clem Baggs. Not a doubt of it, we shall win. Hello, ladies. God in hell! If any more labor gains come through, I do believe he'll wreck the machine. We'll be lucky to get 250, 260 seats against Labour's 290. The Liberals will hold a civilized balance. MacDonald would be foolish to take office with those. You're a fool if you believe that. Merciful God, he's hungry for office. Don't you know that? We've been whipped, Prime Minister, whipped by a Scots Presbyterian counter jumper. All the same, Winston, I'm glad you increased your majority at Epping. For what? The devil I did. Oh, really? I thought. You don't have to concede, you know, not immediately. You... 
You look tired, Prime Minister Winston. I do believe we should We could hang break. on if you'd offer Lloyd George whatever he wants for his 60 liberals. Ah, he wants my head. And I won't give Labour the satisfaction of handing it to him. Well, if you're not up to it, then uh, someone else could hold the party in office. Who, Winston? At least hang on and let the Liberals take the odium of turning us out on a vote. Well, I think the proper thing, the decent thing, is, is to go. It could do no harm to let the country see the mess Labour makes of government. No harm? Oh, God, Chamberlain. What would your constituency party make of that? Actually, I know my I'm constituency, Winston, philosophy. and the true feelings of the party. I've served it, loyally, I hope, from the beginning of my political life. Yes, I'm sorry, Winston, we're all um, cut up. It's been a disaster. Uh, but in time, we shall... Time. What time do I have? Good night, Prime Minister. You're laughing at me. And so is the Duke. With affectionate respect, my dear. Most affectionate. But Andrew says that politicians can't really, well, not really believe in democracy and all that because all of them would love, simply love, to stay in power forever. I say steady on. I didn't quite say that, Mr. Churchill. What I did say was that... Well, sir, I learned one great lesson from my father, whose service to his country was as great as the ingratitude it showed him. And that was, never, never be afraid of democracy. Unless, and I refer to the fact that these days there are only first class carriages on the Paris night train, unless democracy obliges one to travel in the same compartment as one's servant. <laughs> oh, come now, please. Who is Professor Lenoir? He is a great man, my dear. A physicist extraordinary, a mathematician of genius, a great friend, loyal friend, a disinterested sage who rises above our vulgar calculations and also owns a, a, a Rolls Royce and a supercharged Mercedes. The morality of my opinions is not relevant, but a moral action, since you press me, I would define as one that brings advantage to my friends. Well, I as one that brings confusion to my enemies, though, of course, they are mostly Democrats, like myself. Not those Bolshes of the so-called Labour Party, Winston. Oh, it is sometimes necessary, my dear Sonny, under our representative institutions, to defer to their opinion. I say, shouldn't you have a caution now? I mean, with respect, sir. If the Tories are to run a jolly proper opposition, won't you have to eat those words? Young sir, I've often eaten my words. But in the main, I have found them a most wholesome diet. <laughs> Winston! I hear you've started on the biography of the great Duke. Well, it was always my intention, you know, Sonny. Always put it all. Well, now, Harrops have offered me 10,000 pounds as an advance. Standing beneath his pillar yesterday, I was reminded of something that one of his soldiers wrote after the great man had been foully dismissed. Left-hand page, second paragraph. Read that. Read it aloud, Sonny. You'll get the feeling. They are doing strange things in Great Britain. They have overturned our Captain General Churchill, and we are without a head. 
They have driven him from all his public offices. And, but for what? Winston. You're not throwing in the towel, are you? You never think what you're worth, do you, Sonny? Not often. Why? I'm nearly 55. It's a damn rare Churchill who lives beyond 60, you know that. I've had a good run, but I'm finished as a politician, as a minister, anyway. It's only six years since I crossed the house from the Liberal benches, and the Tory party can't forget that. I needed another administration to set me firmly on the road to the premiership. Now that chance is gone. Papa had to face that, too. So, I must find another source of income. I see. What? Well, since the British won't listen to me anymore, perhaps I can find um, some uh, foreigners who will. in here, in this here pad. Can't you cover that on the close-up? That arrow was extremely lifelike. Most impressive. Is off. he all right? Oh, sure, he'll be just fine. But he took such a terrible crash when he fell off that pony. Oh, but see, he's used to it. He used to do that all the time before he became a movie star. Do you mean to say that he was a, a real cowboy before all this, Miss Davis? Of course he was a real cowboy, and then he became a stunt rider, and now he's a movie star. The only difference is he used to get two bucks a week, and now he gets 5,000. Right, Jack, set it all up. $5,000 a week, is that what he gets? Sure. Oh, Lord, Randolph. You'll just have to become a movie star. Too damn risky, <laughs> Papa. Look at the politics or journalism. Much safer. <laughs> Not much safer and far less well paid, I promise you. <laughs> you know, I have a, a great idea. Hey, W.R., can we do a shot of Winston and Randy here? And then it could be like a, a record of their trip. And you could show it to them when we get back to Hollywood. Marion, it's a wonderful idea. Now, oh, Bill. Oh, Bill, I want you to do something for me. I want you to set up by Mr. Churchill. But Mr. Hurst, we've got to get this shot in before we wrap. Can't we do it another time? Now, let's do it now, Bill. Mr. Hurst, we're going to lose this light. Bill, let's just get it all set up. OK, sir. Um, Mr. Churchill, would you sit right over there, please? We'll bring the cameras right over. Over there, indeed, sir, I shall. All right, everybody. The next setup is over there. Mr. Churchill and party. This is most kind of you, Mr. Hurst. Not at all. It's our pleasure. Is this going to be a talking picture, Mr. Davis? Oh, yes, it will be, and it's a total waste of time. These talkies, you know, won't be in for more than a year. At least that's what Charlie Chaplin says. And you know there's nothing wrong with him, except he's a, a little crap. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to have a very peculiar speaking voice. Oh, Stop. well, so do I. But they want to use me in the talkies. It's absolutely ridiculous, you know, because I can't even act. Now you're lying again. Not this time. Oh, no, you're a great actress. You're a great, she's a great actress. You know all the critics agree with me. Of course they do, darling, especially when they're in your newspapers, because you write all the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> These pictures must make a great deal of money, Mr. Hurst. Well, that's why I make them, Winston. Maybe I should write you a scenario on the life of Napoleon, perhaps. That's a grand story. Uh, and Miss Davis could play Josephine. Here, here. 
you think the movies can afford you? You're a statesman and a politician, not a motion picture act. Besides, your skill is an oratory. Well, it's good of you to say so, sir. I am indeed a politician, and I shall indeed continue talking wherever I uh, find people who will listen to me. But the written word is more permanent than the spoken one. Now, that's true. It pays better, too, doesn't it? It would certainly seem to be so in your case, Mr. Hurst. Well, people buy my papers. They like what I have to say. And they do as you tell them. I like to think I have some influence over events. People don't have to buy my papers, but they do. The pocketbook, it seems, is more accurate than the ballot box. And a strong free press is necessary in our democracy. Wouldn't you say? Does freedom of the press allow uh, misrepresentation and misquotation? Your editorial on my San Francisco speech in the Examiner was uh, hardly accurate. Oh, Winston. What's that got to do with the price of eggs? Well, sir, my brief is to reassure the American peoples of our unbreakable belief in the democratic process and in those ideals which are shared by our two great nations. Maybe. But who do you really speak for? Do you speak for England? Prime Minister MacDonald certainly is no friend of America. Now, is he? You and your party are out of office. Perhaps your voice is a cry in the wilderness. It is true that uh, some of my views on India and the British Empire do not find favor in Westminster, but I'm afraid that time will prove me right, alas. I'm sure of it. Profit without honor. Well, maybe, maybe you could write a few articles for us, telling the American people all about British politics, Winston. Well, but uh, would you retain editorial control? <laughs> well, of course. Sit down here, my dear. And you retain several thousand dollars. That's a fair bargain, is it not? That sounds pretty good to me, sir. What do you say to that, Miss Davis? Oh, well, if you're talking about politics, Winston, don't ask me. Politics are way out of my cycle entirely. Oh. I am thoroughly motion pictures, and I'm not even good at that. Absolute nonsense. I'm sure you're brilliant at everything, Miss David. Excuse me, Mr. Hurst. We're all ready now. All fine, Bill. Roll away. Roll away. Roll the camera. Come on, up. Come on, up. Come on in and join us in this picture. I want you to meet Mr. Churchill. Roll the camera. I'm most honored to meet you. All right, now, everybody, look this I, way, I, I, please. Mr. Churchill. Sir, Mr. Churchill. Sir, would you look this way, please? Sir, Mr. Churchill. Oh, yes. Oh, that's great. Come on, forward. What do they pay you, sir, for doing what you do? Randolph is an admirable companion. He takes a most intelligent interest in everything. Though he does sleep 10, even 12 hours a day, I suppose it is his mind and body growing at the same time. I love him very much. He reminds me of myself at his age. I miss you and the kittens more than I can say, and it grieves me to hear that you've been feeling lonely. What else does Papa have to say? Oh, he sends love to both of you. Now, Mary, if you would finish your breakfast, I will read it all out to you afterwards. I want to hear it now. Afterwards. But Mama... Mary? Mama, why didn't you go with them to America? Don't you want me to be here with you? Of course I do. But you have left us before. What do you mean? I mean, you have gone away before, on your own, on holidays and things. Well, yes, but only when you were away at school. Well, I don't mind, Mama, honestly. I just wondered. Why don't you and Papa ever go on holidays together? You must understand, my dear, that sometimes people need to get away from each other even when they love each other very much. Anyway, this isn't really a holiday at all. Randolph says it's tremendous fun. Oh, but not for your father. 
He's really working very hard. Uh, how much more do you hope to earn while you're here, Mr. Churchill? Well, no, I've made some rough calculations for the remainder of my lecture. Most efficient. Here we are. San Francisco, 3,000. Pounds? Yeah, dollars. Yes. Dollars. Santa Barbara. Well, Mr. Churchill, uh, perhaps you could give me a rough idea of the total, so I know how much you want me to invest. Oh, yes, I see. Well, by the time I reach Chicago, I hope to have $20,000 for you. Well, Mr. Churchill, it's a pleasure to do business with you. I shall invest this straight away, and uh, you will send me further monies as you receive them. I will indeed. Mr. Baldwin and Sir Samuel Hoare have arrived, Prime Minister. Sir Samuel? Well, uh, show them in, would you, Geoffrey? Gentlemen. Thank you. Morning, Ramsay. Prime Minister. Good morning, Stanley. Hoare. Um, well, forgive me, but I rather thought you would come alone. Well, yes, of course. Uh, but uh, the fact is that if we are to discuss uh, foreign affairs, I should prefer uh, Sam to be here, too. May I? Oh, yes, yes, please. These foreign affairs aren't what uh, you'll call my strong point. Well, just like yourself, Ray. Um, Gentlemen, I have a proposal to make. I have been having lengthy discussions with the Viceroy. And we both feel that the time has come to offer dominion status to India. It would be an act of faith on our part and, uh, and restore confidence in the British government. I would dearly like this to be a bipartisan policy. It would give the people of India the clear impression that we are united in our belief in their eventual self-government. If such a move would uh, promote confidence, well, then I think we could uh, come in with you on this one issue. That is most encouraging. But can you bring your party with you? I don't want a brawl in the house over this. No, there's bound to be problems, certainly. But we must convince them of the rightness of our cause. What about Churchill and his imperialist friends? Can you convince them? They'll make the most frightful hoo-ha if you can't. Perhaps so, which is why we must move quickly. Fortunately, Winston is several thousand miles away and doesn't plan to return until November. But when he does get back... Prime Minister, I have as little time for Winston as you do. And by November, I shall have discredited any value his ideas on India may have within the Conservative Party. For those of us who are British, our great dependencies, our empire, are even more surely the foundation of our power and safety. Britain must regain our former strength and confidence in our role in the world. We must stand together with the other English-speaking peoples, with, with our American cousins, as the guardians of world peace. Two thousand dollars. Very dear. Value to money, wouldn't you say? A stirring speech, Mr. Churchill. Oh, thank you, thank you. Great stuff. You know, I traveled two hundred miles to be here tonight. That's more than flattering, sir. George, you know my son, right? No. no. Hello. No. My wife is dearly loved me. Excuse me, sir. Oh, it's Mr. Baruch. Do you know Mr. Baruch? A little. We fought a war together. <laughs> Winston! Bernie! It's great to see My you again. Very <laughs> friend. I have so much to thank you for. I, I don't know how to begin. Well, then don't. <laughs> Randolph and I have been traveling in the lap of luxury. Staying at the very best hotels, it's entirely yeah. thanks to you. I dare say you do the same for me if I was in England. But sadly, I do not possess my own private train. If I did, you would be the first to ride in it. You're not overdoing it, are you, Winston? Mm. You can use my yacht next week if you feel like relaxing. This week, if it comes to that, I can easily turf my daughter off it. Yeah, turf? 
Well, if you use the use the vernacular of the English public school. <laughs> well, put it down to spending the war with one of its members. How did you find Van Antwerp? Well, I doubt if my money could be in uh, a dollar or safer hands. <laughs> I agree. Then you're doing well, I hope. Oh, well, yes, but I, I'm not here solely uh, for financial gain. Winston, there is nothing wrong in making money. I've spent most of my life doing it. I know, but I also wish to afford your countrymen a, a proper perspective of the problems confronting my own country at the present time. Your perspective? Well, whose else would you propose? <laughs> and where do you go to next? Yeah, uh, Omaha, Chicago, Detroit, and finally New York. I'm going to arrange for a stenographer to join the train at Omaha. Someone who can type as well, help you with your notes. And you're staying with me in Chicago. Well, that will be wonderful, Bernie, but there's no need for all this. Think nothing of it. Well, I do so wish that Clemmy could be here to see such kindness and generosity. She would know how to thank you so much better than I do. How is Clemmy? Well, she's well, I suppose. We communicate, of course, but by telegraph and letter one can say so little. It's our anniversary today, 21 years. You don't say. Well, congratulations. What a wonderful achievement. You know, in all this time away, what I miss most is simply talking to her. Then you shall talk to her. Of course you shall. My dear fellow, follow me. Winston, oh, is it really you? Ah, uh, yes. I'm afraid I'm availing myself yet again of Bernie's astonishing hospitality. Clemmy sends you a love. Well, tell her I return the compliment. Bernie sends you his love back. What? No, I'm not tired, my darling. Prohibition. Uh, no, I, I don't regard it as especially good for me. <laughs> yes, yes, they're both here. Will you speak to them? I understand. Yes, Sarah. Yes. Oh, yes, of course, my darling. Goodbye. Papa? Hello, Sam. Uh, what can I do for you? I am sorry to disturb you at this late hour, SB, but it, but it is important. I, I don't imagine you've heard the news. The Viceroy, he has made a public declaration in New Delhi promising the Indians dominion status. This is going to be the devil of a political storm here. Yes, Edward's sense of timing leaves a lot to, to be desired. I had hoped to prepare our people for this rather more gently. Well, so had I. And the backbenchers are only too well aware that whilst the government is socialist, the Viceroy is a Tory. So they're bound to think that we've put him up to this announcement. The diehards will be most upset. Winston, I imagine, will be quite demented with fury. Yes, almost certainly. But, um... He doesn't uh, get back until November, does he? Uh, so that uh, gives you uh, nearly a month, for Sam. Well, we can't allow the party to repudiate Edward's uh, declaration simply because we appear to be in cahoots with the socialists over it, dear. Uh, so it'll be your job uh, to convince him, Sam. Oh, I know there'll be uh, many hell from Winston and uh, one or two others. But more than one or two, I feel. Well, but uh, Winston's not here to lead them, and they're just a rabble. Uh, Without him. No, you're our authority on India, and uh, so you'll just have to pull the party together uh, behind uh, this policy. Won't you? Mr. Churchill, I have to tell you that your stocks in Simmons and Sherwoods are down by several points. I dare say there's nothing to worry about, but of course, if you wish me to sell. No, 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 no. Put more money in. I sent you the check from Omaha. Now is the time to buy. I'm sure of it, Mr. Van Antwerp. Good goodbye. Silly man. He's starting to twitch just because mm -hmm. the market's fallen a point or two. He lacks the true gambler's instinct. Well, you will be careful, won't you, Papa? Well. Are you going to uh, offer me a farewell drink? Certainly not. I want you to return to your Oxford cloister pure in mind and body. 
I shall miss you. Well, besides, I need to conserve my supplies. Well, I'll see you for breakfast then. Night, Papa. Randolph. You will be sure and tell your mother how much I long to be back with her, won't you? Well, I begin to be weary of this incessant hurtling through space. I dream of Chartwell. time you spend here, Bernie, in Chicago? Not as much as I'd like. I'd say about two months of the year. Most of my work takes me to New York. I can't imagine why, but my wife complains that it's too big for us. <laughs> but it's, it's magnificent. <laughs> I hear Chartwell is quite a place. Oh, dear man, it's only a cocky title. <laughs> Tell me, Bernie, I've always wanted to ask you. How did you make your first million? <laughs> By doing what my mother told me. I put everything I had into something called amalgamated copper. Well, on the day it started to drop, I got a message from my mother hoping that I would observe the Day of Atonement. So, as a dutiful son should, I went home for Yom Kippur, and as part of the observation of the holiday, I didn't answer the telephone. If I had, I would have sold out at ten points. But I didn't. And Jehovah smiled down upon you. Oh, he certainly did. And when I did so, at 40 points, I made 700,000. It's a damn fool thing to do. I could have lost everything. You mean to say that you, 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 you think that Van Antwerp is right, that I should not hang on, that I, I shouldn't wait for Jehovah to smile down upon me? But why not if it worked for you? Because you're a politician, Winston. Making money is work for life. I was a politician. Well, I've served my country to the best of my ability. And nobody could object if I spend the few years that remain to me uh, providing for my wife and children. Well, of course no one can object, but have you got the talent for it? Well, I've done very well so far. I've been lucky. I've made thousands. And what if your luck should run out? You're not hiding anything from me, Bernie. I, if something's happened, I'd far prefer to know. Well, I'm not sure. But I must return to New York tonight. We could travel together, if you like. It's probably only rumors. But rumors are damn dangerous in this business. Once people start to panic... Well, let's hope to God I'm wrong, Winston. Come on. The avalanche of selling on New York Stock Exchange continues unabated. Wall Street itself is a scene of hopeless confusion with terror-stricken stockholders saying, sell, sell, sell. I shall return to England tomorrow. I can lend you money, Winston. Anything you want. My dear Bernie, how can you lend me money? You must have been hit proportionately as hard as I've been. I have money overseas. I shall survive. I always have. How much have you lost? Too much. No, damn it. Everything, every bloody penny. Ruined. If only I'd taken your advice and got out a while ago, it was good. No, but I gave it too late. I'm sorry, Winston. No, I wouldn't listen to you. I wouldn't listen to Van Antwerp. If Croesus himself had been my advisor, I'd have taken no notice. What's going on? God. I'm 
suppose this is how Wall Street will be remembered today, by some poor bastard jumping out of a window in despair. guilty of garbaricide. Winston. Garbaricide. Ah, Clemmy, my dear, how nice to see you. Good evening, Mr. Bracken. So, the wandering warrior has returned. We weren't expecting you, were we? I presume you're staying to dinner. If I may. Where's Winston? Winston! Welcome back, my old friend. What a time to choose. You shouldn't have gone away, should you? No, I shouldn't. Had I remained, I should be sitting under this, instead of on it. Oh, hang that tree. Clemmy was right about it, as you well know. Uh, We've got more important fish to fry. Have we? Don't you know? What? Hasn't anybody told you? The government's decided to give away India. McDonald's announced it in the house, and our lot are going along with it. Baldwin's bulldozed them through. You should have been here, shouldn't you, Winston? Why weren't you here? I am here. I am here now. 